Hi, Roman. Uh, let me start by saying that internet uh, censorship practices are pervasive, but it changes from country to country and uh, time to time. And for that reason, many researchers in the field have been interested in measuring it globally and continuously. Um, we can state this problem formally as um, how we can detect whether two pairs of hosts can talk to each other. And we want to know that for many hosts around the world and many sites. Let's say a Chinese user to a site in Sweden. Current approaches, um, this is a very hard problem, and current approaches um, is to put instrumentation in a user's or a site by installing a software, um, by installing a software either um, at the user's or handing in a Raspberry Pis or simply renting VPNs. And as you can imagine, this approach has, it has their own disadvantage. For example, um, there are not that many volunteers or um, VPNs to rent. Um, so usually, measuring censorship, usually measuring censorship uh, involves uh, some um, uh, sensitive topics and can increase risk. And um, least, uh, last but not least, uh, the data that is being collected are not continuous. Um, several years ago, Jet Kirandel and I at UNM started to think about this problem differently. What if we can uh, measure whether two hosts can talk to each other remotely uh, from somewhere else around the world? At first, it sounds impossible, but we came up with a technique that's called hybrid Adela scan or a spooky scan. A spooky scan is a TCP IP side channel that uh, off the pass remotely can detect whether two hosts can talk to each other and if not, in which direction the packets are being dropped. Remember, it's off the pass and remote. Now, in this talk, we build on a spooky uh, and construct Augur, a system that uh, measure connectivity disruption globally and continuously. Let me give you some background. You all must remember TCP handshake, but one thing you might not remember is in any of the packets that go back and forth, there is an IP ID field, which is a 16 bit and, uh, bits, and it's been used for fragmentation reason. And I use this IP ID a lot. There is a part of TCP protocol set, if you send the unsolicited packets to a host, it uh, should respond back with a reset. Another part of the protocol said, if you send the same packet to a, machine, uh, to a host with open port, it should send you a CNAC. And if you don't send a proper ACK or reset, it has to retransmit because TCP is reliable. Um, for a spooky, a user doesn't need to be end user. So from now on, instead of user, I call it reflector. And for a spooky, reflector needs to maintain global IP ID behavior. That means global IP ID, uh, that means the IP ID values have to be generated by a shared uh, global counter. And um, disregard of what the packets goes to, or disregard of the destination. By looking at this counter at each time, uh, we can guess how many traffics the machine is generated. So it's spooky start by a measure machine, let's say I, send a CNAC packet to a reflector which maintains global IP ID behavior. In response, uh, I will receive a reset, but in that reset, um, I will see IP ID value, the current value of that. The next step, I send a spoof scene packet using a reflector IP as a source IP. So site will receive that and obviously send a CNAC to whoever's on it. Reflector here. Reflector receives unsolicited CNAC, so it's going to send a reset. Consequently, the IP ID is going to be increment by one. So then again, I ask for IP ID value, um, uh, I will see a delta IP ID 2. So I can guess that somebody talked to in here, in this example site. If I do again ask for IP ID, I won't see any change except my own IP ID query. So imagine a scenario when the site to the reflector is being blocked. In that case, well, um, none of the packets from the site will get to the reflector. So the changes in IP ID that I will observe is only results of my own IP ID queries. And it, bear with me in the next scenario when the packet from reflector to site is being blocked, uh, the CNAC from the site gets to the reflector. Reflector will create a reset, 
Consequently, IPID will increment it. And for the first second, I see a, a jump of two. Then the retransmission will kick in, and IPID again increment by one. So in the next uh, successive IPID query, also I'm going to see a uh, jump of two. So it will be two, two. So let me pull all this together. We have a three cases and three different ways that IPID, uh, the delta, uh, we have for Delta IPIDs, and therefore we can detect them. In reality, the reflectors have other uh, machines or hosts to talk to, and therefore we have to cope with the noise. The simplest, in, uh, most intuitive way to deal with that is uh, instead of sending one uh, spoof scene packet, we amplify the signal and send n spoof packets. And for a variety of reasons, packet can get lost, um, reflector can receive a sudden burst of traffic, so it makes sense to repeat the measurement. There is another good insight, which is not all the reflectors have the same level of noise. Uh, and if we want to measure something continually and, and globally, um, uh, then we need to exploit that. So all, put all this together, uh, this is, how, uh, uh, this is uh, the auger's probing method. For four seconds, I do IPID query. And for one second, um, over one second, I send 10 spoof scene packet while I'm watching the IPID query. Then I look at the delta IPIDs. Do I see a jump, a sudden jump? How confident I am that this jump is the results of my own spoof packet? Well, uh, I continue um, this runs until I'm confident. It turns out there is a statistical analysis that can help, and that's the sequential hypothesis testing, and it can help us to gradually build confidence by repeatedly running. Uh, the, uh, and running and collecting samples. Um, I'm going to give you a very light version of how augers use sequential hypothesis testing, but I refer you to the paper for uh, the details. So, um, Augur adopts sequential hypotheses by first defining um, a random, uh, random variables that models uh, how IPID accelerates uh, under uh, perturbation that we cause. We also then calculate some um, known outcome probabilities or priors. Putting all together, then we can uh, formalize an algorithm that helps us to detect the case. Um, and uh, the algorithm is basically uh, a start by uh, collecting one trial uh, and um, updating the sequence of values for our random variables, then check these samples of value, what is the likelihood of this sample of value belong to the distribution that blocked happen or does not happen. And we continue that until um, we reach to a, a desired um, uh, a statistical significance. Okay. This is how Augur put all these pieces together. Well, first we scan the whole IPv4 to find global IPID machines. Then we filter them based on some criteria. For example, all these machines are stable. Uh, the, given the list of websites th that we are interested to measure, we first resolve them and then check whether the hosts are passing some criteria. For example, we transmit enough of SYNAC. Uh, then we run um, many parallel measurements, um, making sure that neither the site or, nor reflectors are mm, being used in uh, the same measurement at the given time. Then we use our uh, statistical analysis and um, finalize the results. I started the talk by saying that there are three key challenges. Um, first, coverage, ethics, and continuity. Augur um, solved the problem of coverage by offering more than 22.7 million uh, reflectors, potential reflectors. The second best case that we have is um, less than 10,000 uh, probes by right path last. You might, uh, with respect to ethics, you might say, well, Augur creates some traffic from site to reflectors, and it may appear that these two are communicating, and if the site is sensitive, then, well, uh, that can cause risk. Augur reduced the risk by running measurement from the routers to hop back from the trace routes endpoint. And um, even with putting such a harsh constraint, we have more than 53,000 vantage points over 180 countries. 
Well, how about continuity? Augur doesn't, um, uh, Augur doesn't depend on volunteers' connectivity or on reliable Raspberry Pis, so we can run measurement continuously. To summarize, Augur uh, overcomes the key challenges of the previous approaches. To test run the framework, we started by collecting uh, 2,000 reflectors over 180 countries, and we selected 2,000 sites, half of which were sensitive, and there were instances of them being blocked somewhere around the world, and the other half was popular websites. And we let Augur run for 17 days. Um, uh, first thing first, we wanted to validate the technique, and that what it says if that by itself is very hard because um, most, most of the time we don't have ground truth. And um, we started by saying, let's look at the aggregated results and check whether in, it matches the reasonable assumption we have about connectivity disruption. For example, um, one reflector shouldn't show um, um, block, all the sites block or majority of the site block. So it shouldn't be blocked for many reflectors. And um, we said we should see um, block for a more bias towards a sensitive block and a sensitive sites. And indeed, that's what we observed. Another way of validating is like, uh, can we replicate the previous finding? And that was the case as well. All these validation steps that we did increased our confidence about the accuracy of the technique. So let me give you some highlight of the results. These are the ten, uh, top six um, uh, block sites from site to ref reflector direction. And an interesting example is Amtrak.com, which is the ranked sixth, and it's being observed being blocked in 57% uh, of countries. And the reason is it's being resolved to the IP that two other sensitive domains also being resolved to. And um, uh, looking, uh, digging further, we found that Amter, uh, probably Amtrak is using a cheap DNS service um, that uses a HTTP redirect. Uh, this is uh, the top six from the other direction, which is from reflector to site. And you can see NSA.gov stays at the top. Um, and considering the nature of the site, we can uh, say, we can probably say, uh, perhaps this is being blocked on the site side or server side. And this is a common practice um, for protecting websites to protect themselves from DOS attacks or um, following embargo rules, uh, they usually block their services for a specific region. And actually, Augur provides an environment for us to dig further and systematically study this, which is a future work. Well, one can say, hey, what if your technique become uh, uh, famous and sensors start to evade it? Is it possible? Indeed, some adversaries can. For example, um, they can um, establish a stateful firewall and block unsolicited CNAC packet. Or they can, for example, let the TCP control packet but block the data um, uh, packets. Or simply just block the measurement IP. Um, we believe that for the first two, implementing such techniques are really challenging, especially in the national level. And for the third, of course, um, we can mitigate that by um, uh, periodically changing the measurement machine IP. Augur is great, but it has its own limitation. Um, although connectivity, um, connectivity disruption has a, a, a strong indication that censorship might, ha might happen, but not necessarily, and we cannot distinguish that. Um, Augur's geolocation accuracy depends on um, public or uh, commercial geolocation databases. And as you know, when it comes to router, geolocation, uh, uh, geolocation databases are notoriously bad, so there should be a future work about that. And uh, finally, um, using Augur, we can say that there is a blocking happening between um, a site and a reflector, but we cannot say in which hop, where in the past the blocking happens. And um, for example, is it the ISP of the person, government, or the site side? And we need to come up with more techniques to be able to actually guess where exactly it happens. Let me summarize the talk by saying that Augur is a system that uses TCP IP side channel uh, to uh, measure connectivity disruption, 
globally and continuously. And now I'm open to questions. Thank you. Hi, thanks for your talk. Piers O'Hanlon, um, Oxford. Um, I was just curious, uh, the, um, you know, mentioned sort of SPF sort of checks, like uh, the uh, source routing sort of stuff, because if you're spoofing packets, mm -hmm. it's interesting that you're not seeing that much of an effect from that. So uh, for, to be able to spoof packets, you have to talk to your upstreams and um, make sure that uh, they don't drop your packets. And actually, in three universities that I've been um, involved with, we could actually let the, ups, uh, uh, the upstream let us be able to do a spoof packets. Um, yes, um, this is another um, caveat about a spooky scan or agar, which is like we are using a spoofing in a right uh, or um, or a neat way, rather than what is spoof uh, spoofing is famous for. So. Thanks, yeah. You, you described the challenges a sensor would have to try to defeat your mechanisms pretty well. So how powerful would a sensor have to be compared to the power that, say, China has today? Um, that actually, people ask this question. For example, governments that are, um, uh, like, have enough of, um, uh, money to be able to uh, spend on their firewalls, would they, wouldn't they do that? So in, to be able to do that, like establishing a stateful firewall, they have to make sure um, they are synchronized over the um, older um, firewalls, all their systems, for example, if the scene goes through another, Travis, another pass, or CNAC goes to other, they have to be able to make sure this happens. And being able to sync at a very a real time, that's really hard. Um, and if they just um, uh, try to establish that, I, I think it's, it's very impressive. Right. That, yeah, they'd probably try to find where your measurement sites were and keep play and find them and and block those as you change them? There are many ways that uh, people can block. For example, it's IP blocking, DNS, and um, uh, URL or keyword blocking. And uh, as it turns out, like IP blocking is um, detecting that is good, but the more we traverse towards CDNs, then um, it, it's, not, uh, it's not the right way to block that because by blocking the IPF, uh, the domain, then you are blocking the whole CDN. So yeah, then we move to the DNS level blocking and uh, HTTP blocking or so on. I, this uh, particular side channel has been exploited over the years for, for many things. I'm uh, curious, uh, what would, is your opinion of the fact that it exists? Is it a severe design flaw in TCP IP? Uh, would, would it, uh, if you were designing it, would you allow it to be there? Or would you provide another mechanism mm -hmm. for doing what it is that you, you need? Yeah, that's actually a really good question because uh, it shouldn't be a, um, machines that maintain a global um, IP ID, uh, basically, and so that you can learn such information. And um, uh, the current version of, for example, Linux doesn't do that. Uh, they randomize the uh, IP ID per session or per connection. And um, the ones that, for example, I use is like Windows XP or FreeBSD, um, and we still have 22.7 thousand of them, a million of them. And uh, I have to say, this is an example of a side channel, we have actually uh, many more side channel. That by itself suggests that when we des de design our protocols, we didn't think about privacy and security. So here you are. We have um, yeah, shared resources that we can use, but I'm very thankful of them. So. Thank you, and thank you for encouraging people to upgrade from Windows XP. Definitely. <laughs> All right, let's thank uh, Laura.